MTV's The Real World is credited for being a pioneer for modern day reality television. The groundbreaking series made its debut in 1992 and instantly made a mark for bringing strangers from different walks of life together and making them housemates in a healthy environment to confront controversial topics like race, politics, sexuality, and religion. Now, almost 30 years later, the seven original housemates of The Real World, New York, are reuniting for a new Paramount Plus limited series titled the Real World Homecoming New York. We're going to play a preview. We were both in a heated emotion. I'm not saying you, I'm saying me too. When it's heated emotions, people become defensive and it's hard for them to listen to the other person. You're speaking for yourself as being defensive. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay, I wasn't being defensive. I just want to make that very clear. Well, you may not have, but you certainly were emotional. That's what I'm talking about. See, that's... No, that's not racist, Kevin. That's just how two gonna, people being that way. How are you going to... Because that's, they're passionate. That's the reason why we're having this conversation, because All you... Right, then I guess we just don't agree. That is the problem, because... But it doesn't make me a racist. So cast member Kevin Powell joins us now with more on the show and how reality television has changed over the course of three decades. Thank you so much for joining us. Boy, you see that little snippet and you think uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same. <laughs> when you were in the house in New York, um, the country was dealing with the L.A. riots and the conversations about race relations and policing that, that bubbled up because of that. That was 1992. And you really sort of used that platform. I don't know how aware you were of what you were doing or the impact it would have, but you use that platform to, to talk about these issues, these really uncomfortable issues. Now fast forward and, um, you know, the reboot is coming after sort of this long summer of protests that have really kind of continued. We're all awaiting the verdict, the Derek Chauvin uh, verdict. And so I'm wondering, you know, how much does it, particularly when you sort of, after you've gone through the experience in, in the house, how much has changed in America, do you think, over the past 30 years? Well, well, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm a fan of yours and Vlad, and Vlad so I just want to say that it's really an honor to be here with you both, so thank you. Um, it's, it's really deep, the question, because you're right. We, our show was Rodney King, L.A., Riot, Rebellion. We just, we, our show now, the reboot, we literally had the insurrection on January 6th, and then we had, we have this Derek Chauvin trial happening. Uh, some things have changed. You know, the first African American biracial multicultural president of the United States, Barack Obama, uh, certainly my life, uh, the life of some folks around me individually, we've been able to do some things because of, of, of over the last 30 years. But the fact is, I can leave my home right now in Brooklyn, New York, and, and, and not survive because of who I am is the, is the fundamental problem with racism in this country. But it's not just racism, it's sexism, it's homophobia, it's transphobia, it's all these different isms and phobias and hatreds that unfortunately a lot of us in America still carry around. So the show, both then and now, to me, is really an incredible mirror of, of what is possible with, with our country. We're bringing these different people together, even with these uncomfortable conversations, but also how much work we still have to do. And it has to be all of us. It can't just be real, it just can't be black people or people of color dealing with race. It can't just be women dealing with gender oppression. It has to be all of us. Kevin, it's uh, great to see you again, my friend. Um, and Thank as you. we yeah, set up in the intro there, uh, you were, of course, one of the original cast members of The Real World and one of the first black housemates along with Heather uh, Gardner. Tell us how it felt to reunite with everyone and to reflect uh, on the time on the show almost 30 years later. I know when you and I spoke last month, you, you guys were sort of surprised that they actually decided to put you, um, that they thought about putting you back in the same apartment. It was incredible. The, the loft was actually on sale for like, I think, five or six million dollars, which I certainly can't afford, but it's, <laughs> it's, that's what it's selling for. And it was open for like a week and we had a window of a week to get in there. So it was really incredible to go back to the same space because really think about it. When in your lifetime can you go back from when you were a young person and reflect on, you know, something that happened 20, nearly 30 years ago? It was like our big chill moment. But at the same time, I was wondering because we didn't have text messages. We didn't really have cell phones the way we do now. We didn't have social media. We didn't have email. I was wondering how people were going to respond. The response has been incredible, overwhelming. Literally, my phone is going off as we're talking right now, Instagram, Twitter, et cetera, because people are watching it, both Gen Xers, but also a lot of millennials, and saying that, you know, it's actually helping them to understand some things around these common, these difficult, uncomfortable conversations, especially because we just came out of the Trump era of all this hostility because of the insurrection, because of, of Breonna Taylor and, and George Floyd and everything that's happened. So I think it's it's been a blessing to be able to do this, and we're still the same people we were in the 
then in the sense that we're still having open, honest conversations, even if we don't agree with each other. So speaking of the Trump era and race and gender, you have a new book out. It's called When We Free the World, and it touches on those topics. Um, and those topics also came up in the real world homecoming. Um, you know, tell us a little bit about your book and why you felt it was important to write it. Well, I mean, if you just look at the cover of the book, young people of all different identities and backgrounds, that's intentional because my point is, how do we bring people together and what are we what are we leaving for these generations that are coming behind us? You know, are we going to just let just say, you know, we can't deal with racism, we can't deal with sexism, homophobia, transphobia, any of it. And my point of the book, which is also the point, I believe, of the real world reboot, is we have to be willing to have these difficult conversations. It's got to be rooted in love. We've got to be able to listen to each other. But it's possible. It's actually possible because, you know, you look at the show, there's new shows. You see myself and Norman talking. He's a queer white male. I'm a straight heterosexual black male. We're both we're, we're able to support each other. I can say I'm anti-homophobia. He can say I'm anti-racism. And it's beautiful, you know, and that's what I want to see. And that's what the book is about. And I really feel if people watch these new episodes, that's what the show is about. Um, Kevin, one of the things, you may not know this, Anne-Marie is a big reality show watcher, um, <laughs> more so than I am. Um, and you, you and I and Heather B. talked about this um, yeah. Which is that when you guys were doing the real world, first of all, like even the producers and the shooters, the cameramen and women didn't really know what this was going to be like. And there were a lot of breaks. You, they, there weren't cameras in every nook and cranny 24-7 the way it is right now. But one thing that I think um, is, is really different is... You all were selected because you were basically normal people. You hadn't done mm -hmm. anything like this before. Heather B. already had a career. She was already a well-known uh, hip-hop star. But the, for the most part, you guys were sort of at the very cusps of becoming who you were going to be as adults. Um, and there's been a lot of talk in reality TV now about folks who do things when they're younger, or, um, you know, in their teen years that come back to somehow, you know, uh, affect their livelihoods and their careers now. Um, and yet, it strikes me, and I, this is the thing I, I was so focused on in our interview, which is that, you know, um, nothing, reality TV has been degrading, in my opinion, slowly ever since the real world, because now the people that turn up on the real world do know what it means to be on TV. They do know what it means to have a brand. They are on social media. They have, in some cases, they already have thousands and thousands of followers on social media. Compare and contrast sort of the era that you guys were in and where we are now. We were all artists. We were creative people. Julia Dancer, Andre and Becky were musicians. Heather, a musician. Norman, a visual artist. You know, myself, a writer. We all were creative people. We were just, you know, between the ages of 19 and 25, just trying to do our thing. And, you know, we had no idea. There was nothing before us. And so we didn't know that you could actually become the Kardashians or Cardi B and parlay <laughs> this thing into, or Paris Hilton, any of these folks who have made, you know, gigantic careers off of, off of reality TV. Uh, we didn't know what to do. What I remember is going to the VMAs in 1992, the Video Music Awards MTV, and that was the year that Michael Jackson, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Nirvana, all these amazing folks were there, and people were screaming for us as loud as they were screaming for those folks. We were like, this is shocking. And so nothing really prepared us for it, but everyone since then has had the benefit of watching. This is how it went in the beginning. I, I'll say this, you know, um, um, I have no regrets about doing the show the first time. I have no regrets about doing it this time because I realized that you know, no, did I, did I know I was going to go in there and talk, have these deep conversations about racism back then or even now? No. But what I did know is that I've always been a civil and human rights activist since I was a youth, since I was in college, and that these issues are, are important to me, and that we have an incredible platform, and, and it does actually does touch people's lives. And what's really touched my life are these long testimonials from fans, literally now, you know, saying, you know, I watched you when I was 8 years old, 10 years old, 15 years old, 20 years old. I was a college student, as you said, Vlad, when we did the interview before, and I've watched your trajectory. And so I can't speak to what has happened with reality TV, but what I will say is what has really, really touched my heart the most is people have said with these new six new episodes on Paramount Plus that we have not, we've been waiting for a reality show like this that really, really speaks to things in a way that we haven't seen in a while. And I hope that it leads to a shift in reality TV in general, because I literally woke up this morning to a fight on one of the reality TV shows, and maybe Amber, you know what I'm talking about, where a wig was thrown or something crazy was happening. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not you who know, we are. We don't I... do that. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Vlad could tell you all about The Bachelor from day one to present. So don't let him try to make it.
make it sound like he's all highbrow and I'm not. Only Masterpiece Theater in my house, Amory. <laughs> I mean, sure. I will not sure. lie. I watch these things periodically through the years. I'm like, okay, this is fascinating. What it's become, but I still read books. I, you know, I like my art. No, she got me. Too, I'm so a Bachelor we... fan. I watch Bachelor. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so then let so let let me bring you then to some current sort of current news, news of the day. Actually, our our lead yeah. story today has, of course, been the Derek Chauvin trial. You know, and as you were talking about um, uh, what it was like to be on the original show versus now, obviously social media is has been sort of a big factor right it yeah. amplifies your voice it amplifies images and certainly what we saw with um, Derek Chauvin and George Floyd is that video of George Floyd which would have normally been just watched in the United States but because of social media was broadcast across the world and the protests that we saw erupt in this country were you know, repeated in England, in France, in, I mean, you name it. Um, and so I, I want to ask you about that, about um, the impact of George Floyd's death, what you hope will come out of the trial, but also what you hope will come out of his, his, his killing, that it will be more than just, you know, a viral video, obviously. I'll tell you, if I can bring it back to the real world for a second, Norman, one of my castmates, called me, reached out to me last May when the, when it was when it happened, you know, and he said, you know, I just want to say I'm, I apologize to you because I didn't understand a lot of things you were saying, you know, back in 1992 with the original show, but I've been watching these viral videos for the last few years, and this one obviously is, is so egregious, you know, so obvious that he was murdered. Um, so my hope and what I've seen from a lot of people, because as you said, it's been a multicultural army of people that have been out there protesting in America, our country, and all over around the world, that people of all different backgrounds understand if, if one group of people are not free, then no people are free. I think that's number one. Number two, we want Derek Chauvin to go to jail. I'm saying that as an activist, as a leader in this country, we need to set a precedent that is not okay for a police officer on videotape when clearly someone is down, unarmed, on his stomach, crying out, mama, 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 and he's literally killed after eight minutes and 46 seconds. He should be in jail for a very long time, if not for the rest of his life. Because if he does not go to jail, you know, if there's a hung jury, we're basically saying that we still do not value the lives of black people and other people of color in any way, or women, or queer folks, or any group that's been marginalized. And we have to stop this. What is George Floyd to me? It's Emmett Till for the 21st century. We know what happened to Emmett Till. This is the same exact thing, in my opinion. Uh, Kevin Powell with some very powerful words uh, reacting to uh, what has been happening now in 2021 and 2020. Uh, Kevin, it's always great to talk to you for your perspective. Um, and I, as Amory was saying, it, you know, because the fact that we didn't have social media back in 1992, things have really changed. I mean, we Amory mentioned Rodney King. We had that video, and and mm -hmm. and that is what led to sort of an awakening um, in this country about how sometimes. Uh, African Americans are treated at the hands of police. And subsequent to that, um, we've had many instances of video. You mentioned Emmett Till. That picture of Emmett Till in his coffin, okay. right? That was the that was a big, big turning point in the civil rights movement in this country. Um, and and so to have your perspective on on all that we've witnessed in just the past uh, uh, twenty odd years since you did the real world is really important for us to have. Thank let you. Let me just let sure. me just add this one quick thing. The difference with us now, even with Emmett Till and uh, uh, Rodney King, with the George Floyd situation, is that social media, in its best form, actually has brought together people to have conversations in real time. That's been incredible. Mm. When people are hitting me up saying, hey, I'm a white person. I want to be anti-racist. What do I read? What do I watch? What do I listen to? That is a blessing, which is why I think you've seen this massive outpouring over the last year from people of all different backgrounds, because it's not just people of color out there. It's not. It's everybody. Right on. Kevin Powell, thank you, my friend. Appreciate it. Thank you all.